Hello book lovers and welcome back or welcome to Nat Cat's Bookish Cafe. Today I am here to do my August wrap up. All right guys, we are gonna do this speed round <laughs> because I got places to be and I don't want to keep my family waiting but I do want to go ahead and wrap up the month of August because it is September 1st and that means Aurelium is starting and I am ready to leave August behind and focus fully on achieving my September TBR. I do have I believe seven books to talk about today and then also a couple of DNFs and of course before we jump into those I will be giving my overall stats for the month of August. So this month I ended up reading a total of 10 books which has been relatively normal for this year. However it seems like my page count was a little bit low sitting at 1,936 pages. I have to admit I was a little surprised that it was so low considering I read three books over 500 pages this month though one of those was an audiobook but still one book over 500, another book over 600 pages. I guess a lot of the other books that I was reading were on the shorter side. But that being said, I listened to 64.29 hours of audiobooks, which is the highest amount of audiobook listening that I have done since January. So the page count might have been lower, but I was listening to more audiobooks. The bright side, my average rating for the month was a 4.35, which actually brought my annual average over a 4.0 because I was sitting like just below it. So I was really happy for that. To break down the star ratings, I did have two DNFs that I did not rate. I had one 3.5 star rating, which was my lowest of the month, which considering the month before I had a two star and a 2.5 star, uh, it was really great that the majority of my books were all over a three star. I did have four four star ratings, two 4.5 star ratings, and three five star ratings. Without further ado, let's jump in to the DNFs real quick. I'm just gonna not give them much time because I don't have much time. The first is The Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren. If you watch my mid-month check-in, you might not be surprised that it is here because I was talking about that I wasn't really feeling it and that I didn't really want to return to it. I ended up getting about, I think it was 90 pages. Yes, exactly 90 pages through this book. And when it came time to return to it, I decided I didn't want to. So I never ended up picking it up again. I'm just feeling very picky about my contemporary romances right now. I really hope you can't hear those cows bellowing. He must be like moving them or feeding them or something because they are super noisy. So I'm sorry if you can hear them. They're fine. No one's giving birth. No one's being attacked by coyotes. That's just the noise that they make <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but that being said, like I said, I'm not super into contemporary romances right now, to be honest. And this was just giving me nothing. And so I had no reason to return to the story. And so I will be DNFing it. All right, I closed the window. So hopefully you can hear the cows a little less because they were they were going off. <laughs> but the second book I DNF'd was Lobazana by Romina Garber. And I can't even remember how far I got through this book. I think I might have gotten like about 20% through it. I was listening to the audiobook. I picked this book up for a prompt for Kim's TBR battle that she does over on her channel. Her channel is Expedition Through Pages. And I wanted to go ahead and read a book for my team team elephants woo uh for a prompt of an author who is from south america but unfortunately i was just not feeling this book no hate towards it, it 
is I think a young adult book and it just wasn't gripping me. The characters, the plot, it was giving kind of werewolves. I'm not really sure what was going on. I didn't get enough into the story to fully grasp the concept or anything. No hate towards the story, it just wasn't for me. All right guys, sorry if you come to my channel for my in-depth reviews because you ain't getting them today. But the first book that I finished here in the second half of the month was Summer Suns by Ali Mandel and I ended up giving this book four stars. So this is a kind of gothic horror paranormal story. In this book we are following Andrew and he was best friends with a man called Eddie. They have been best friends for a very long time and the two of them when they were younger went through something slightly traumatic that left them very strongly bonded. However Eddie and up going to university a little bit before Andrew and Andrew is supposed to join him at this university however days before he is supposed to join him Eddie commits suicide and Andrew can't help but feel that he did not commit suicide but was in fact murdered and when Eddie's ghost starts to haunt him it becomes more clear that something sketchy was going on. So Andrew goes to the school he starts to live where Eddie was living with his roommate Riley. He's very suspicious of Riley especially because it seems that Riley knew that Eddie and Andrew can see the dead which no one's supposed to know and Andrew tries very hard to ignore the fact that he can do that however they however he starts to fall in with Riley and his cousin and their crew of car racers or street racers I guess you would call them so it seems like a group that's very messy possibly dangerous and he thinks that Eddie probably got in trouble with them and so he is trying to get close to them to see what they did. However as he's there he starts to discover that Eddie was looking into some stuff that maybe he shouldn't have been. Maybe someone at the university was involved instead of these dangerous street racers and also it seems like it is up to Andrew to figure out how to break this curse that he and Eddie were given when they were younger so that Eddie's soul can rest. This book is very queer. It is very, dare I say, horny? <laughs> that might seem like a weird thing to say, but our character here and Eddie had a very strong connection. And while Eddie always denied the fact that they were more than friends. Uh, it was very clear that they had a kind of bond that you just don't share with just a friend, you know? And Andrew, who has been in denial about his sexuality because he's been in denial about his feelings over Eddie, uh, is starting to realize that maybe he is in fact a queer man and he is struggling with that on top of his grief over Eddie as well as all the drama with his roommate and his roommate's cousin and all the stress of university. Our guy is going through a lot and he is not dealing with it well at all. I really enjoyed the writing and the story. I acknowledge that the pacing is too slow which is why I couldn't give it a full five star. I feel like if you are not as invested in our character's queer awakening and in the outcome of this murder mystery and the writing, you're gonna be bored. Um, but I would leave you by saying that the relationship between Andrew and another person, I'm not gonna tell you who, was in a way giving me the same vibes as Andrew and Neil from the Foxhole Court. In fact, the whole Whole dynamic between all the characters in here was giving super toxic yet at the same time a very strong bond with people that can relate to your trauma in a way that no one else can just kind of like the foxes and foxhole court so if you like the dynamics in the foxhole court you might like this as well I would also say that if you enjoyed the raven boys it kind of gives that same gothic 
paranormal aspect as the Raven Boys, um, but make it adult. I would also say it gives hints of Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. So I really think that you should go into this book for the vibes because the plot itself, while decent, um, is a little bit meandery and slow. And sometimes I did feel like there were some things that really needed to be fleshed out a bit more. But overall, I had a good time with the story. I was really glad that I went ahead and picked it up. Up next, I finished an audiobook, and that is You Should Be So Lucky by Kat Sebastian, which is the sequel to We Could Be So Good. We would be so good. I can't remember the exact title of the book, but this is a companion novel following a new couple. We are following Eddie, a baseball player, and Mark. Mark was present in the first book. He was a friend of one of the main characters who had recently lost his romantic partner at a very young age. He died of, I believe, cancer. And so in this book, we're kind of following him where he continues to work at the magazine despite his partner leaving him a lot of money um, and him not really needing to work, but he just needs to keep his mind off of the fact that he's now living alone in his home without that partner that he's been with for years. And on the other hand, we are following Eddie, who is not having a great season at all. In fact, he has like not hit a single ball. He keeps striking out <laughs> and he is not well loved by his team or by the baseball fans of New York because when he was told that he would be traded to their team, he was very upset about it. Um, and he was very upset about it in front of reporters. And so New Yorkers are like, what, we not good enough for you or something? And his team is obviously like, oh, he thinks he's still good for us. And so he has just not been enjoying his time in New York. He's away from his family. He himself is a closeted gay man. And while he found kind of a rhythm in his old town to be able to, you know, have secret hookups, he does not feel comfortable doing that here in New York, especially now that he's so recognizable and that is putting a lot of pressure on him and negatively impacting his game. Now the magazine that Mark is working for asks him to do like daily or weekly diaries about Eddie. They're like, hey, we want to kind of help Eddie out a little bit here. So maybe you can interview him once a week and just kind of write an article about him a little bit. And Mark is like, I don't do sports. So and they're like, yeah, but you're the only one that we can give this task. And so he and Eddie start to kind of talk and they start to become friends. Uh, and when Eddie starts to realize that Mark is queer, um, the two of them obviously take a lot of comfort in each other because this is a historical setting. So you cannot be really an openly queer person here. So I absolutely love these books. I love the audiobooks just because I love the accents of the characters and just the way that the narrator um, brings the characters to life. I think it does a really great job. I did give this a book a 4.5 star rating. I love the humor in the story, but I also love how emotional they are, obviously, with Eddie dealing with moving away from home and just not really knowing his place in the world and kind of feeling like his life in baseball is maybe coming to an end. Um, and then Mark, on the other hand, he's kind of dealing with um, still grieving his partner, but, but also starting to feel love for another man and just kind of trying to figure out how to move from one love to the other uh, was really a great to witness. So overall, if you love Cat Sebastian, I'm sure most of us do. <laughs> she does a really great job with historical romances. Uh, you should definitely check out this book, even if you don't like baseball, because I don't like baseball. Uh, but I really love this story. Up next, I read Children of Fallen Gods by Carissa Broadbent. And I did read this physically. Um, however, it was due back at the library. So I no longer have it, which is fine by me because that book is heavy and I don't want to lift it anyway. But this is the second book to Daughter 
Mirror of No Worlds and this is a fantasy romance. Luckily for me, heavy on the fantasy with the romance being more of a side plot which is the way I like my fantasy romances and this book we are falling to Sana and she was a slave for the kingdom of Thrall and one day she approached her master with a thousand pieces of gold because he had told her if she collected a thousand pieces of gold he would let her go. However his response was not what she expected and maybe it was what she should have expected and that was for him to be incredibly angry that she wants to leave him and accusing of her of sleeping with people to get the money which she did not do um, and he tries to whip her to death and her response to this is for her magic to burst out of her and accidentally kill him. She herself is half human and half whatever the people are called that have slight magical abilities <laughs> from Ari? Ari? I, I forget the kingdom's names. It's great enough that I remembered one of the kingdom names. Either way, she escapes her kingdom of Thrall with the help of one of her slave friends and she escapes to this other kingdom that houses the Order which has magical humans living there and she asks them to train her and once she becomes one of them she wants their help going back to Thrall to rescue the rest of the slaves. From there the plot builds and thickens and nothing is as Tazana wants, especially as she starts getting trained by Max, who is not a big fan of the Order because of how they have hurt him in the past, and he really helps open her eyes to how they are not the saviors that she was hoping they would be. Now in the second book, I obviously can't tell you about what was going on with it, but I will tell you I gave it five stars. It was over 600 pages, but there was no breathing room in this book. There was just so much plot. The author was just not coming up for air. There were so many things happening, so much twisting and turning and revealing and there was a new character that we were following the point of view from which I thought was really interesting especially since I guessed relatively early on who they were um and I was right and I thought it was really great um hearing from their point of view and just there was so much drama there was so much war and it was it was just such an incredible read I really did not want to put it down so so I think a lot of people say book two and three are better than book one um, and so far I definitely need to agree with that. I think that the pacing of the story was a, let, a lot better here in the second book and I am really intrigued to see where we go in book three which is 700 pages so I am a little intimidated by that. After reading a book that's over 600 pages I had to pick up a quick comic <laughs> and that is going to be volume five of Offense. This is by C.S. Bacat, Joanna La Fuente, and Joanna the Mad and this is a contemporary story. We are following a fencing team, a high school fencing team, super queer, super diverse. Our main character is Nicholas and he is the about son of a very famous fencer and he grew up relatively poor. Uh, his family unfortunately his mother has passed away and he is given the opportunity to fence for this high school team via a scholarship and he is just very driven to be an incredible fencer and he is given the opportunity to do a lot of improvement when Seiji I want to say is his name Seiji is also at this school and he is one of the best fencers in the country and so Nicholas declares himself Seiji's rival and Seiji is like no offense but I'm like way better than you but they are roommates and they are friends and I really enjoyed this volume of it. I gave it four stars. It's just a fun time. I really enjoy the characters and their banter and as far as the fencing stuff goes I don't care that much but I'm here for the characters and their relationships. So I think 
that volume six is out and I don't think there's a volume seven yet. So I am approaching the point where I'm caught up on this series. So I'm a little nervous about how long I'll have to wait to um, continue reading about these characters. Up next, I read my challenge book for the month and that is Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor. I do have a spoiler filled reading vlog for this book, which I feel like I'm going to put out this Monday so it should be out already but I will just give you a few general thoughts on it. I ended up giving this book 4.5 stars. This is a well-known story where we are following Laszlo Strange who is obsessed with the town of Weep which is a town that had once existed and then ceased to exist about 200 years ago and he has been studying this town for many a years and one day he is given the opportunity to visit it when some warriors from that town or is it a town is it a kingdom we'll say kingdom from that kingdom arrive and ask for the help of some of the kingdoms Lazo's kingdom's most intelligent people because they have a problem that they can't solve themselves. And so Laszlo heads there and there he meets our other character Sarai who is also known as the Muse of Nightmares. This book I really did enjoy it. I think it had some slight pacing uh, issues and I did struggle to connect to Laszlo as a character a little bit just because I felt like we focused a lot more on Sarai as well as the plots but overall I thought that it was a very magical whimsical romantic story and that of course like everyone says the writing was absolutely beautiful the author set us up well for book two I am definitely very eager to get to it I already purchased it so hopefully it'll show up at my house in the next few days and I can get it on my TBR sooner rather than later uh, but an excellent story uh, that is definitely worth all the hype that it gets. Up next I had some time to read a, another audiobook and I decided to pick up The Collective by Allison Galen. This was the book from my These Books Will Self Destruct that I went ahead and saved so that I could accomplish my 2024 goal of reading three of those books because I had previously only read two of them and so I decided to save this one and read it and I'm so glad that I did. I ended up giving this four stars. Essentially in this book we are following a woman whose daughter was and this is going to sound very harsh so I apologize but she was raped and left for dead in the woods by a young man who faced zero consequences because he managed to find witnesses that said that he was not the one that left with her. This mother has obviously been grieving for many years and her anger has been building and she is approached by a woman who offers her the opportunity to join an online forum where women can really vent all the anger and murderous desires that they have for those that have killed their children and never faced justice. After a very angry message that she sent, the creator of the group reaches out to see if she would like to take part in some what our character assumes is role playing that will lead to the death of one of the murderers that, and could eventually then lead to the death of her daughter's murder. She doesn't really think that it's a real thing but she goes along with it. You know she sends the knife and she acts as someone's alibi and things like that just thinking that it's cathartic and then she starts to realize that maybe it's a little bit more than that and then it starts to seem like maybe this group is a little darker and more dangerous than she she originally thought. I love a revenge story. You really have to be down with people wanting to gut people like a fish in this because these are very angry mothers who lost their children and the people who took them faced zero consequences. So this story is rage from page one to the last page and I really did enjoy it quite a lot. There was a part of me I couldn't decide if I liked the ending or not which is why I ended up on a four star rating uh, but overall it was a very satisfying read. And for the final book that I managed to just squeeze in at the end of the month and I was super happy because it was 
is a five star prediction is a world running down by al hez this is a sci-fi dystopian story where we are following our trans main character valentine and an ai that has been stuffed into the body of an android and his name is osric yes osric <laughs> which is kind of a funky name anyway valentine is a scavenger here in post-apocalyptic america he takes on a lot of the more dangerous time-consuming jobs and one day osric this ai shows up and says hey the lady that has purchased me has asked for you specifically to collect some of the androids that have left her service it seems that this lady's manager had stolen these androids and was heading to another city and in exchange for the androids being returned she will offer valentine and his scavenger partner their visas as well as a good sum of money and valentine's dream has always been to have a visa so that he can go into the cities because they have free health care and he will then be able to get his testosterone as well as his top surgery and he's like yes we will definitely take this job however as he goes along with this he starts to develop feelings for osric and osric start starts to have feelings for him as well and on top of that the androids might be a little bit more sentient than they originally expected and Valentine isn't really comfortable dragging them back to their master and so he starts to wonder if getting a visa is really worth it. I quite enjoyed this book. I ended up giving it four stars so not quite a five star read. I can't really tell you what kept it from a five star. I think that maybe Maybe I never connected to the characters as much as I wanted to and sometimes I did feel like the plot was a little bit meandery uh, but overall I really did enjoy the parallels between Osric's journey and Valentine. Valentine being a trans person and Osric being an AI that has been stuffed into a body and has never experienced the body and doesn't really know if they're comfortable with this experience experience and also them being an AI um, and being treated as an inferior uh, android has been very hard for him as well. Technically some of his rights have been stripped because him being an AI also known as a steward had closer rights to humans than androids and so just the parallel between these two characters um, and them bonding over their discomfort with their current bodies was really well done. There was also a depiction of a toxic relationship in here that I thought was done pretty well and there were some action scenes. None of them um, overly thrilled me. I don't think that I ever was like I can't put the book down I need to see what happens next. Um, so the story didn't grip me as much as I wanted it to but there was also quite a few fun moments in here um, and I really do think that it was focusing heavily on the commentary and that was was done really well and also the romance between our two characters was um very sweet so I really enjoyed that aspect of it and I will definitely be trying some more work by this author all right guys so those are all the books that I have read this month or at least in the second half as always if you would like to see what I read in the first half of the month I will go ahead and link that up above I would love to know what your guys's favorite book of the month was I think I'm gonna have to say that Children of Falling Gods was my favorite book this month um, and I would also love to know what your least favorite book of the month was and mine ended up being Shanae Lende by Darcy Little Badger but I still gave it 3.5 stars so I would still highly recommend you check out that book. As always guys thank you so much for supporting my channel by watching my videos and I hope to see you next time. Bye! Thank you.